Hey, you guys, in this care plan, we are going to be looking at the diagnosis bronchiolitis or respiratory syncytial virus, as it's sometimes called. What we're going to do in this care plan is look at a basic description of the diagnosis, your subjective and objective data, and your nursing interventions and rationales. Bronchiolitis is one of the most common infections of the lungs that we see in children and infants. And the ages that we usually see this diagnosed are from birth to two years of age. Now, the most common cause of bronchiolitis is a virus that's called respiratory syncytial virus or RSV. It is extremely, extremely contagious and it's spread through droplet and airborne. Um, so you need to pay attention to that when you're doing your patient care and you're planning your infection control. Now, RSV is actually um, pretty much just a common cold, but this becomes a really big problem for our infants and toddlers because their airways are so much smaller than ours. Um, and when this happens, you're gonna end up with problems um, like, like inflammation, uh, mucus secretion, which is gonna obstruct the flow of air, and then sometimes you can even end up with an atelectasis occurring. Now, our top priority for a patient who has bronchiolitis and what we really want for them to achieve is for them to have adequate oxygenation and gas exchange. Um, we hope to keep them afebrile if we can, and then we really want to make sure that we maintain adequate nutrition. All right, let's look at the specifics for our care plan. For your subjective data, the most important thing to be aware of is that these patients are likely going to have a decreased appetite um, and they're going to be having poor feeding. This is especially true for infants. Um, there is a lot of chorizal symptoms here, so lots of runny noses. So just imagine trying to feed from a bottle when your nose is all blocked up with snot. It's really, really tough. Um, in your verbal patients, you may hear them complain of uh, common symptoms that we see with colds like headaches sore throat, um, and even fatigue. Okay, the objective data that you want to be aware of here um, is that runny nose that I mentioned, a persistent cough, wheezing potentially, uh, sometimes crackles as well, fever, uh, usually a low-grade fever, not too high, um, and then you're going to see symptoms like tachypnea, retractions, and nasal flaring all of which are going to be indicators of an increase in the child's work of breathing. And remember, we said that feeding is really likely to be a problem, um, so you're very likely to see symptoms of dehydration as well. Now let's go ahead and take a look at our interventions and our rationales. The first thing we want to do is perform a very thorough respiratory assessment. This means that we're going to take our time and we're going to watch the child breathe to get a sense of their work of breathing because we really need to know um, if they're having those recessions and retractions and if they are in any kind of respiratory distress. We also need to auscultate their lungs and we're listening for things like wheezing and coughing. One thing I always say about babies with bronchiolitis is that they have very, very noisy chests, lots of sounds that you can hear there. Okay, next we want to assess vital signs and capillary refill. Um, these patients are often going to have temperatures, so we're going to see an increase in temp, and then along with that, your increase in heart rate and an increase in respiratory rate are very, very common. Sluggish capillary refill times may be present in your patients that are poorly hydrated, and they may also be an indication of sepsis, so definitely be on the lookout for that. Thinking back to our difficulty with feeding, our next intervention is to really promote good hydration and treat um, that lack of fluid that they may have. So we need to be monitoring their fluid intake, and we need to encourage oral fluids. And if they aren't taking those oral fluids well, we need to administer IV fluids as necessary. NG tubes are becoming a really common way to manage this as well. So we'll put an NG tube down, and then we can continue giving that baby formula or breast milk. Okay, the next couple of interventions that we're going to look at here are focused on improving the patient's breathing. Now, probably the most basic thing that we can help any patient with when they're having a difficulty breathing is their position. So we want to position the patient in an upright position. Um, and the easiest way to do that is elevate the head of bed. 
And actually, most cribs are going to have a way for you to do that as well. So don't forget that. You can elevate the head of bed of a crib also. And basically what this is going to do, it's going to help their lungs expand and increase their air exchange. Our next really simple intervention to help with respiratory effort is to provide suction. Um, you want to make sure you follow your um, hospital protocol on this, and usually it's going to be very non-invasive, um, very simple suctioning of just the nose. Um, and the reason we do that is because prolonged suctioning can actually cause a little bit more inflammation in that airway, um, and we definitely want, don't want to do that. So always non-invasive um, and simple suctioning there. Okay, so as we are trying to do these things to improve their breathing, we need to be monitoring um, their oxygen saturations very, very closely. The parameters for this are going to be um, set by the hospital, but normally you want to keep oxygen saturations above 90%, um, so we need to apply supplemental oxygen if they are below that. Most of the time, that's going to need to be humidified oxygen. Kids tolerate it so much better, and it helps thin that mucus out. All right, those were our interventions that were focused on specifically helping respiratory effort. Now let's think about more general interventions. So this, we have medications that we might be able to give, um, but the way that I usually describe management for, um, or our treatment for bronchiolitis is using the word supportive. And the reason for this is that because most medications are not going to be indicated and helpful. So things like bronchodilators, steroids, and antibiotics, research shows that they are not helpful. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on fluids and oxygen and keeping that temperature down. So those are our main things that we're going to do to help that patient um, um, with their symptoms. For your older patients, you may see them use an incentive spirometer or practice deep breathing techniques, um, and that will help open and clear the bronchioles. For our infants and toddler, though, this may be a bit trickier because they are too little to follow instructions. Um, but sometimes you'll see respiratory therapists use bubbles if the child can cooperate with that. And again, that helps open the bronchioles. Thanks for watching another nursing.com lesson. Click the link below in the description to watch thousands more lessons over on nursing.com. Also, be sure to hit the subscribe and the little bell to make sure you're reminded when new lessons come out. And if you wanna just keep watching more lessons, go ahead and click this video over here to continue learning. Like we always say here at nursing.com, happy nursing.